So thank you very much um, for having me here um, to today's um, exciting summer school. And today's presentation, I'll be actually looking at um, this gender dimension of the digital practices, particularly of migrants here in Australia. And I'll be using some of my case studies in the years of doing research on um, you know, in engaging with different migrant communities and families and individuals. So today's presentation is about um, the title Lock Out or Lock In, Examining Gendered Immobility in the Digital Age. And this is fascinating because if you look at my slide, you can see this visual of the family, uh, particularly in the context of, you know, they're in the street. And then you have the mom caring for the baby, having all of the bottles and then the food. And then you have the father in there uh, being with the mom. But, but it's also interesting how this dynamic can actually be translated or transposed into the digital world, which we'll be unpacking today with some of my case studies and theoretical interventions. So um, today's um, key inquiries be focusing on some of the aspects of really thinking about um, the nexus of immobility and mobility in the digital um, world. So the first inquiry would be focusing on the conduct of personal, familial, and social lives, um, particularly in the context of the pandemic, and understanding how access of gender, age, and class might intersect in the conduct of those different um, aspects of individuals' um, lives. And then we focus on really thinking about this notion of immobility. Like when we start looking at our current climate, um, we are placed in constant travel restrictions, lockdown, and also this cr cross-border um, you know, restrictions that, that are happening um, very frequently because of the surge of the, um, the virus and the pandemic. So there's this um, concept by Hage on immobility, particularly on existential immobility, and really unpacking the idea of the state of stuckness that some people in a particular space or place might feel that they're not um, progressing. They feel like they're stuck. They're very contained or they're living a life in a container. So we want to interrogate this proposition by looking at the role of modern communication technologies and online networks in navigating that immobility that um, Hage is um, proposing. And more importantly, we look at the patterns as well of immobilities created by digital media platforms and how those patterns can provide us insights into understanding of you know what does an inclusive digital society mean for migrants for elderly people in our society and i think you have your discussion here for the workshop and thank you thank you very much uh irvin and i'll see, see rounds of applause uh, in in the chat uh, icons. And indeed, we have about maybe 10 minutes for, for questions and uh, of clarification. Uh, thanks for very much for painting this rich portrait and uh, sketching these rich ethnographic uh, portraits of, uh, uh, of a selection of your participants, as well as providing lots of entry points into the, into the literature, uh, into the field. Um, let, let's see if there are questions of clarification that people maybe want to pose ahead of uh, joining their uh, tutor groups where they will further engage and I saw that you also put this hands-on kind of exercise for inviting students also to work with materials from from their smartphones to think about their own ways uh, of negotiating uh, for example distance in, in times of the pandemic we have one question in in the chat by Muhammad if you could clarify the category of old, yeah, perhaps this is an invitation to speak about age, generation, and yes. Yeah, so, um, based on my study and building on um, United Nations categorization of what considered old, to the old people age sixty-five years old in Australia, that's a categorization of our old people, sixty-five and above. Now, how do you? But obviously, we know that age. Yeah, yes, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Sorry. No, but we all know that age could be a social construction as well. You can you can feel you can be having this um 20-year-old old body, but you sometimes feel that you're actually <laughs> because of the workload, <laughs> you feel like you're already kind of like old in that space. So, but in terms of categorization, um, yes, it's 65 years old and above. Thank you. Mohammed, did that answer your question? Otherwise, please. Follow up. Also, feel free to chat in audio form. Okay, thanks. Any other pointers right now? Otherwise, 
maybe while people still uh, are still digesting, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about uh, uh, your experiences in doing this field work. Uh, also, particularly in light of, for example, the pandemic, uh, what were some of the obstacles that you experienced, but, uh, and also how did you connect uh, with people and bringing them in into your, your field work and how did this differ uh, with pre-pandemic times, let's say, if you could speak to that. Okay, I'll start first with the recruitment process. Okay, let's start with the recruitment process. So um, I started the project last year around, I got the ethics clearance by around, I think it was around March, June, June. And then I started, um, produce, I produced a um, call for participants um, and distributed them via Twitter and also in my website. But I also thought that I would be contacting migrant organizations in Australia. I'm well connected to the Filipino elderly organization. So I was able to tap into that, email them the information. And then I was recommended to some people to contact them. But before I contacted those individuals, the leader in the migrant organization spoke to them first. So there's a kind of like middle person in that space. So she was saying that there's this um, lecturer at Deakin, a Filipino um, lecturer who would want to interview elderly participants. So through that channel, I was able to recruit um, Filipino participants. But because I wanted to diversify my participants, I contacted different organizations as well. And through um, the contacts from Multicultural Victoria and also the Ethnic Community Council of Victoria, I was recommended to some people. And then interestingly, three persons actually emailed me expressing their interest that they want to be, to be interviewed. So one saw my leaflet in my website. She was, he was saying, oh, so we saw your, your leaflet <laughs> with this old person. I was like, oh. <laughs> you know, we saw the, the leaflet and then we want to participate in your research. I was like, that, that's good. So that, that's, um, yeah, so I got them. So they're a couple, Indian couple. And then one got um, an information from Multicultural Victoria, Australia, and then emailed me again. And then started expressing that she wanted to be interviewed. So I got those participants um, through connections, through recommendations, and also um, having the networks in that space. So when I started doing the interviews, it was actually challenging, especially for the consent form. Because of the fact that we were in a lockdown, I was thinking um, to, in, to ask the participant before, actually before the lockdown, I was thinking, my, my notion was like, okay, I'll approach them, and then I'll ask them to sign the paper, we can read, I can ex um, explain it, and then you know, they can sign if they want to. But the, the problem with the pandemic, with the, we're, we were in a lockdown last year. So we weren't allowed to move out, to move around. And then what I did, my, my colleague told me as an alternative for um, a consent, physical consent form would be one, it's either you send the consent form via mail, like a physical snail mail, which I did for some participants. But then she also suggested that you can also do an audio consent. An audio consent is you don't do it in one go, you schedule. So today, you con I contact, for example, I contacted the participant today. I talk about the research. I explain the research. If she or he's happy to proceed with participating in the research, then I schedule another day to record her his or her confirmation via audio. So I'm basically reading the consent form. Do you agree to have your um, session recorded? He, he or she will be saying, yes, I agree. Do you, need, do you agree with the follow-up interview? Yes or no, I, I don't agree, something like that. So that was the second session. And then after the consent um, audio consent recording, then we proceeded to the interview. So it actually saved a lot of time for me because if I will wait um, for this, the letter um, to, to arrive to them, and also the cost, and I was thinking, would they have the kind of like network or the time to send back to me the consent form, physical consent form? That would be really challenging. But it's also interesting because some requested for the physical copy, and then <laughs> a family member took a photo of the signed form and then sent to me. So you can, that, that process is already showing about multi-generational relationships because the, the, the grandchildren were sending photo to me of the consent form signed by their grandma. <laughs> and I was like, wow, <laughs> this is interesting. And even in the interview, so, so that, that's how I actually generated the consent interviews. 
um, through audio consent and also some um, physical paper. And also with the voucher, because I provided um, some vouchers for participation um, with the participants. So some requested it to be emailed because they know how to scan to use it um, through their email, but some preferred it to be printed and to be sent to them. And then I follow up if they receive the voucher and then they message me on through um, SMS that they receive it. So they're kind of like back and forth communication in that environment. Okay, the interviewing is very fascinating because out of the 15 participants, I had six on Zoom and then um, the rest phone call. Those who were in Zoom, fascinatingly, family members set up the Zoom set up for them. So that's already a data because it's a literacy um, component of the interview and also the care. Like when I interviewed, for example, I was talking about um, um, Rosa a while ago. That granddaughter, she jumped in during the interview because she was she was telling me that I think her she was I, I think my grand my struggling with the question in English because I didn't have a translator. That's a, another um limitation of the, the gathering of the, the um, data. So she was like, I think my grandma is struggling. So I'll just translate what they're saying in Macedonia and then translate it to her. If she can speak it in, in, in Macedonia, I'll translate it to you in English. So there was a back and forth, but also the setup of the Zoom and the, phone, the speaker phone. She set up everything for the grandma. And then the grandma was saying, oh, I love my granddaughter. <laughs> She's helping us. So uh, that kind of like dynamic happening in the domestic space, but also entangled in the research space of the internet, of the, the online space, but also understanding that the formation of the setup actually is already informed by that um, intergenerational relationship. And also some participants thought that I can see them on Zoom, which I can see them, but it's just their head. <laughs> the positioning of the camera was on the head. And he was like, oh, Irving, you didn't tell me that's my head. Oh, I, I thought because you actually want it to be that way. He was like, no, 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 I, I know how to do it. <laughs> so it, it was um, hitting the head, but it's not his face. So it's like, he was telling me, yeah, I know how to do it, but it's just that, well, I thought it's, I, I, you're seeing me, like my full face. And I said, no, I wasn't seeing your full face the entire interview. I was, but I didn't say that I'm, I, I was talking to your, you know, your forehead. It, it was like, you know, this uh, <laughs> interviewing process, I asked, I just let him, you know, answer the questions. And also some of the participants um, recently, because I did the recent follow-up interviews with them, they're now very adept in moving their um, device and showing me things in their house. For example, one was like, oh, Irvin, look at this magazine. I actually wrote an article about my experiences here here. So he, she, the, the participant was moving the camera and showing the magazine. That's an interesting um, idea when it comes to field work because that materiality in the digital space would be prompting something about you know, your participants, stuff like that. And I think also, um, the reason why I use Lego 